Hello, welcome to the SETI Colloquium series. I'm Atiyah Chuk, and I have the honor to introduce Dan Akarib, who comes uh, to give us a talk. He's coming from Slack as Stanford. Before being at Stanford, uh, Dan uh, was undergrad at University of Chicago. Then he got his PhD at Princeton. He was a postdoc at Caltech and Berkeley. Then he spent a long time at Case, Case Western. Um, but we have better weather, so he came <laughs> back to the Bay Area, and he is working on the experimental detections of uh, dark matter, which is uh, a, great, a great subject, and he's going to tell us all about it. Dan? Thanks, Mattia. Thank you. So for those of you who are unfamiliar with Case Western, it's in Cleveland, Ohio, uh, current home of LeBron James. So I have to apologize when I'm going with the home team for, uh, yeah, for the NBA done. finals. Oh, so <laughs> but once that's over, I, 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 uh, I, I, I look forward to Steph Curry being my guy, too. So anyway, <laughs> we'll see. NBA finals you yeah, right, right, right. One apiece right now. So anyway, it's exciting. Uh, and dark matter is also exciting. And I hope to, hope to convey um, my excitement to, to you for that subject as well. Um, and so I'll be talking to you about WIMPs, weakly interacting massive particles, which are one of the favored candidates uh, for a subatomic particle that might have been produced in the Big Bang uh, and make up the dark matter. And I'm, I'm part of two scientific collaborations, uh, the LUX experiment, which stands for the uh, Large Underground Xenon Experiment, uh, and its successor experiment, which we're currently planning and prototyping at Slack called LZ. It's a merger of two collaborations, the Lux collaboration and the Zeppelin collaboration. And uh, we're searching for this cosmic dark matter. Uh, there's sort of three, three themes, in, if you will, to the talk. One is that um, you know, we, it, in searching for dark matter, we posit that we, that we understand gravity through you know, the work of, of Newton and Einstein. Um, but there's a missing piece, there's missing stuff, this dark matter. And if we can't find it, it's hard to really say that we understand gravity. Right? And there alter there's alternative work going on rather than looking for dark matter, looking to see if the laws of gravity themselves can be modified to account for you know, a missing force rather than missing stuff. Right? So it's a big mystery and you know, we, would, we would like to solve it. Another aspect of the mystery which I'll tell you about is that if Newton and Einstein got gravity correct, then the stuff that makes up this missing mass can't be made out of ordinary stuff. It can't be made out of protons, neutrons, material from the periodic table, or as particle physicists call it, baryons. A proton is a baryon. Uh, it's just a fancy name for you know, sort of subatomic particle physics speak for what ordinary matter is made of. We know that there can't be enough ordinary matter in the universe to make up the dark matter. So, if we see dark matter in the form of WIMPs that we're looking for, it will also tell us something new about the fundamental interactions. Um, and the third thing is, you know, can we find it? So I'm going to talk you through how we've built up this hypothesis of dark matter, the WIMP hypothesis in particular, and the detector technology that we've built to go and look for it. And uh, I'll tell you about the LUX experiment, which already has scientific results. Uh, we're currently the best in the world at not seeing dark matter and that's important, um, and that we're following it up with another experiment called LZ, which will you know, increase the sensitivity by, by a factor of 100. Okay, so that's kind of the overview. There's competition out there too, but uh, okay. If the next slide comes up, that would be great. <laughs> Searching for the next slide. Yeah, there we go, okay. Okay, so we'd start with the story of gravity. We understand um, you know, to how gravity works in the solar system. The sun makes up 99% of the mass in the solar system, and, the, and the, the planets orbit around it, and they follow a nice Keplerian law where the gravitational pull of the sun keeps the planets moving in their central orbit. So if you measure the speed of the planets, the orbital speed as a function of distance from the sun, you get this you know, nice curve predicted by um, Newtonian gravity, and everything works fine. Um, now, if you apply the same principles to what's going on uh, in a typical galaxy, measuring the rotation speed of stars and other tracers uh, of the gravitational uh, strength as, as a function of the radius, 
and you make a similar type of graph, now the, the rotation speed of the various test particles as a function of the distance from the center, Newtonian gravity would tell you once, once you're beyond where the bulge and the disk are, most of the visible matter, then you should also fall off you know, with a 1 over r squared force law. And the speed of the object should go down as you get further and further away, just like we saw in the solar system. But what's observed in virtually every galaxy that's studied is that out to very large radii, the speed of the objects is moving very fast. So much faster than can be accounted for by Newtonian gravity. And these, these graphs go by the name of flat rotation curves because they don't, they don't fall off, but they stay flat out to, out to very large radii. So that's, that's evidence for some missing mass or a misunderstood force law on the, on the scale of galaxies. And then we can go to even larger scales, clusters of galaxies, where now each of the yellow blobs in this, uh, in this photograph, a Hubble photograph, are each of, each of those things is a galaxy. And they're gravitationally bound together by their mutual gravitational forces. And one of the ways of studying uh, the amount of mass in those systems is to, is to take advantage of, of gravitational lensing. So occasionally, you find a cluster of galaxies, which is um, just along the line of sight with a very bright object in the background. And because of gravitational lensing, the, the space being bent around the, around the cluster, the background object can be split into multiple images. And that's these little blue blobs that you see here. The, the mass of this cluster is splitting the background object into, into multiple images. So by looking at the amount of that lensing, one can work backwards to find the strength of the lens and compare how much mass is needed to do that lensing with the luminous mass that, that you see directly in an optical telescope. And a, and a mathematical fit to the strength of that lens says that the mass profile can't be expa explained by the spikes due to the luminous mass, but rather that there's some smooth hump of additional mass that's required to, to, to cause all that bending of space time. Now, this was first noticed in the 1930s by uh, the astronomer Fritz Wicke, who was, you know, as you can see by that photo, a bit of a character. He said that you know, much of the universe is not understood, uh, and he called it dark matter. He didn't use the technique of gravitational lensing. That, that, came, that came later, but he studied the relative motion of how fast the different galaxies in that cluster were moving around and applying a, applying a principle called the virial theorem. And that showed that things were just whizzing around much too fast that could be explained by the amount of gravity associated with the luminous stuff. Okay. So we have dark matter on the scale of galaxies. We have dark matter on the scale of clusters. And then on the scale of the full cosmos, there's, there's a set of measurements that have been made that give us an inventory of the universe on, on cosmological scales. Um, now, each of, these, each of these measurements is a colloquium in its own right, so I'm not going to try to do that justice. But just to refer to the fact that um, our inventory of the universe is made up of two components, the energy density of the universe and the matter density of the universe. The energy density is the thing that's causing this expansion to acceler accelerate. It's dominated by this so-called dark energy. Uh, and then the matter density is, is the piece that we're interested in. So we learned something about um, the difference between the energy uh, and the matter from studying distant supernovae. We learned something about the overall ge geometry, the sum of these two quantities by studying the sum. And that gives us this band here in orange. And then we learned something about the matter density by studying the overall um, uh, distribution of matter. Um, and it didn't have to be that these three measurements would all sort of intersect at a single unique point, right? This tiny little uh, error ellipse from the combination of these three measurements tells us that the energy density in the universe uh, in cosmological units, which I'll explain in a moment, is about 0.7. And the matter density in the universe is about 0.3. And they add up to 1 in units of what we call the critical density. So if you had just a density that was, it only had matter in it, you could ask, and you know, we have the Hubble expansion taking place. You could ask, what would the matter density have to be if you waited infinite time for that expansion to coast to a stop? And the value we get for that is called the critical density, and it's kind of the natural units of density for, for cosmology. So in those, in those cosmological units, we've got 0.7 energy density, 0.3 matter density. 
Now, we know from other studies that the total amount of ordinary matter that could be in the universe in cosmological units is shown by this red line here. It's, it's about only about 5% of in, in units of critical density. So now we have this huge, huge mismatch. Observations tell us that the overall matter density is about 0.25 in these units. And observations of ordinary matter say the most you can have is, is 5%. So there's, a, there's like a factor of five mismatch between the total matter density and the matter density in ordinary stuff. So the dark matter problem is a problem about finding the missing stuff to account for all the gravitational forces, but also not being able to go to the periodic table and say, oh, it's, it's made of ordinary stuff. It's got to be some new stuff. So it's kind of a, a twofold mystery. Okay. So the, the, the WIMP hypothesis, the idea that weakly interacting massive particles might have been created in the early universe and make up the dark matter is, is the hypothesis that we're looking at. Basic idea is that in the early universe, um, everything was very hot. Particles were colliding at very high energies, just like the artificial collisions that we make in accelerators today. And because we learned from Einstein that E equals mc squared, you can have two particles collide together at very high energy and make um, more massive particles by converting that kinetic energy uh, into mass. So one example is that a quark and an antiquark uh, at these high speeds in the early universe could collide and make a wimp and an anti-wimp. And you know, maybe those wimps are still around today and we can find them. So we get a clue from particle physics as to what might be possible um, uh, in the early universe. Now, the, we're, we're kind of, in a sense, imposing you know, the answer by making this WIMP hypothesis. We're saying the property of the WIMP has to be that it has mass, so that it's a source of gravity. It also has to be weakly interacting, otherwise we would have seen it already. And that sounds a little bit circular, but we're in the business of proposing <coughs> new particles to solve open questions as long as they haven't already been ruled out by observation. In the case of WIMPs, there's also clues from particle physics, uh, studies of the standard model of particle physics that say, you know, it, there are questions in, you know, the various mass scale the quarks and other subatomic particles that we don't understand yet. We've proposed new models. One is called supersymmetry, hasn't been found yet, uh, like dark matter. People have been searching for it for decades, but it has just the right particle properties to, to suggest that the same outstanding questions in particle physics can also address the dark matter problem. Okay. So it's one thing to say these particles could have been produced uh, in the Big Bang, um, but this reaction can also, can also go the other way. Uh, uh, just as a quark and an antiquark can find each other and annihilate and form a pair of wimps, the opposite reaction can take place. A wimp and an anti-wimp could find each other and annihilate away and we wouldn't have anything left over. And the, the, uh, in, in particle physics, to, to sort of quantify those reactions, we use the idea of cross-section. So let me just explain that a little bit. Um, imagine that you were playing a billiards game blindfolded. The table's about one by two meters. The balls are about three inches on a side. If you were blindfolded and you, somebody set you up to hit the cue ball, there's a reasonable chance that you could get a collision to take place because the cross-sectional area of the balls and the number density, if you will, uh, is the right physical scale for a collision to take place. Right? So we associate the, 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 the probability that two balls hit each other uh, with their physical cross-section. Now, if instead you were playing billiards on, uh, uh, on a table the size of a football field, but the balls were the same size, now on average the particles would be much further apart and the chance of a random collision would be much lower. Or if you were playing on a normal size billiard tables, but now instead of three inch balls, they were a millimeter in diameter, the chances of a random shot causing a collision would be much lower. Okay. So the whole question as to whether dark matter, these WIMPs, would have survived the early universe, that, that, that they would not have annihilated away, depends on their cross-sectional area. If they have very small cross-sections, then they might still be around. So what we can do is, is say, well, we're looking for, from gravity studies, we're looking for this amount of total mass in the form of WIMPs. How small 
would, and how massive would the cross, how small would the cross section of the WIMPs have to be in the early universe? And how large would their mass have to be so that they survived in sufficient numbers, they didn't annihilate away, to be able to make up the dark matter? Okay. And <clears throat> so you can do a detailed calculation of the number density of, of WIMPs as a function of time as the universe was cooling. Um, and at, at very early times, the WIMPs would have a high number density. As the universe cools, the typical kinetic energy in a collision starts to fall, and we have a so-called Boltzmann suppression factor. The number of WIMPs that you could make starts to fall because it takes more energy, uh, sorry, it takes more energy than a typical thermal collision. And eventually, if WIMPs have a small enough cross-section, then they stop finding each other to annihilate away, and they freeze out at, at some, uh, some specific density that doesn't fall any further except for the expansion of the universe. And we call that the freeze out. And by going through this calculation, you can work backwards to say, if I need about uh, 0.25 units of critical density, then what mass range and what cross section would the WIMP have to be to solve uh, this dark matter problem? And we end up with masses on the 10 to 1,000 GeV scale. So a proton weighs about one GeV. So these particles would be you know, 10 to 1,000 proton masses. And they would, they would have cross sections that are typical of the so-called electroweak scale in particle physics. Uh, that's the weak, um, you know, the weak interaction. So as I mentioned before, one of the, one of the um, proposals in particle physics is a new theory called supersymmetry. It's actually an old theory now, but it's new in the sense that it hasn't been discovered yet. Um, and that's one of, the, one of the things that's being searched for at the, uh, at the Large Hadron Collider in Geneva. They sometimes talk about trying to make dark matter in the laboratory by smashing protons together at very high speed. They're trying to reproduce the same sort of collisions that would have taken place in the early universe and see if they can make WIMPs or cousins of WIMPs in the laboratory. And that would be great for us because then we would know we weren't just chasing our tails. Maybe there was actually something out there to, uh, to detect. Okay, so now we take this idea of the, of the WIMP freeze out to get some inference as to the cross-section scale of the, of the WIMPs and their mass. And then, and then we construct a WIMP uh, of scattering experiment. So now we say, well, let's, let's go back to the rotation curve of the galaxy. And let's say all of that missing stuff was made up of weakly interacting massive particles with the cross-sections inferred from uh, this freeze out argument. Okay, so then the Milky Way is embedded in some halo of dark matter. The WIMPs are orbiting around the galactic center just like the solar system is. So we know roughly their speed. They're moving at about a thousandth the speed of light. Um, we don't know their mass, but if we, if we pick a mass then, and we say, well, we're going to infer the matter density, then we can pick a number density. So now we start to have knowledge about the speed of the WIMPs, uh, the flux as a function of mass, and we can start to put together an experiment. Now, one problem is that the WIMPs are so weakly interacting that, and they're similar in that sense to neutrinos. A neutrino or a WIMP could pass through a light year of lead and maybe scatter once. Right? So this is how, you know, th this is how much they don't interact uh, with, uh, with ordinary matter. Now, on the plus side, um, there are many, many WIMPs, if this hypothesis is correct, that are traveling through us. Okay, so we could say that um, you know, a WIMP needs, needs a, 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 a brick of lead, a light year in length, to travel through. Or we could make a detector that was 10 to the minus 16 light years across. That's about a meter. So we can build detectors that are about a meter across. There it turns out that given these numbers, there are on the order of 10 to the 16 WIMPs per year passing through the detector. So we're starting to be in the regime where if all this hangs together and we can build such a detector, we could start to see you know, maybe a few WIMP interactions um, each year. Okay. And that's, that's the scale that we're at now. Just to put this in a little bit of historical context, one of the first WIMP, exper WIMP search experiments that ran uh, was in a, uh, in a germanium detector in 1988. It was designed for a different type of study called double beta decay, um, which I won't go into, but it's, it's, it's very similar technology is required, a, a detector with very good energy resolution, very low radioactivity, and so forth. 
So this detector was converted over to look for energy depositions from a WIMP scattering from a germanium nucleus in a, in a solid state detector. And after um, something like a 100 day run of the experiment, uh, a plot of the energy depositions seen in the detector were, were dominated by various residual radioactive species that couldn't be eliminated. So it was basically the detector and the components of the detector were, you know, were the cause of the eventual background. Right? So if, if WIMPs existed at a particular scale, then they should have shown up in this energy spectrum. You would have seen a falling exponential. If WIMPs were at a smaller cross-section, then they might have been buried in the background. So what you can say from this experiment of a particular duration of a particular mass is that <coughs> any, any WIMP parameters that would have led, say, to this, ex this uh, recoil spectrum are ruled out. And anything below the background, we can't say anything about it yet. We have to build a larger detector, one with lower background. Okay. Now, the other thing I mentioned is that we don't know the mass of the WIMP. We know roughly what the range might be. So we have to interpret the data for all possible WIMP masses. So if we had uh, a WIMP that was, was on, on the lighter scale, it wouldn't deposit as much energy. If we had a WIMP on the heavier scale, it would have a lower flux, but a, a harder spectrum. Uh, it, would, it would come out to higher energies. So each of the spectra that I've sketched here are just on the edge of being detected. So what we can say is that any, any, any light WIMP, um, so now this is WIMP mass versus basically the probability of interaction, any WIMP mass that we can rule out uh, leads to a, a, a dot uh, uh, in, this, in this graph. So by, by considering continuously all of the different WIMP spectra that could be ruled out by this detector, we end up with, with a curve, a so-called upper limit on the WIMP cross-section. So WIMP rate or WIMP cross-section on the vertical axis, WIMP mass or ignorance over here. And what we're saying is that this experiment could rule out all, all WIMP possibilities with mass and cross-section above this curve. And below this curve, we haven't run a sensitive enough experiment to say anything yet. Okay. So we'll come back to that curve later. How do we make, so now we want to switch gears a little bit and talk about the, the, uh, what goes into building a WIMP experiment. Um, the, the basic idea is that you, you have to take advantage of the, the way that particles deposit energy in the target of your detector. Right? And there are the three main modes where a particle will collide in your detector and deposit energy are to, uh, well, eventually everything ends up as heat. Um, if you have a particular type of material that scintillates, then you can get about a percent of the energy appears in, in the form of light. Um, and then if the, if the collisions are energetic enough, they can also ionize the medium and you can try to collect free electrons, ionization signal. So there's a, a very active field word, worldwide that is trying to exploit different aspects of energy depositions. There are experiments that run uh, just with ionization, like this germanium experiment that I showed you uh, from 1988, and there are sort of modern versions of that which are continuing to make progress. There are experiments that just look for the heat energy that's deposited, experiments that just use the scintillation light. And then there are classes of experiments like LUX, which try to measure two quantities simultaneously. So in the liquid xenon detector that I'll describe to you, we measure both an ionization signal and a light signal. And whenever you combine two of these different channels, it gives you more information about what, what type of particle might have um, uh, uh, caused the interaction. Okay. Now that's important because there's always radioactivity left over in your apparatus. You do everything you can to minimize it. So what goes into a good WIMP experiment is trying to reduce the amount of radioactivity, um, trying to have some immunity to backgrounds, which is to say whatever radioactivity you have left can you tell the difference on an event by event basis whether, whether a detected event was more likely to be due to radioactivity or whether it was more likely to be due to a WIMP? And by combining these signals, we, we get some additional immunity to backgrounds. Of course, you want to be able to instrument a large mass because that's basically our collecting area, if you will. The larger the mass, the more sensitivity per unit time because you've just put more atomic nuclei in the path of these WIMPs to give them a chance to interact. 
Um, because you can't get rid of all the radioactivity, you also want to shield the experiment. And this has led us to running these experiments deep underground. Um, and, uh, and then because the WIMPs are not moving very fast, you want to have a very low energy threshold. So, OK. OK. So let's see. Um, so in terms of shielding, Radioactivity from natural materials tops out at about two and a half MeV. Um, so you know the Earth's crust is sort of, <laughs> for me, polluted with uh, uranium and thorium, long-lived radioactivity, uh, and that radioactivity leads to gamma rays. And the gamma rays, the most energetic ones that occur naturally, are at about uh, two and a half MeV. So if you put your detector inside a water shield. This graph shows that, that a typical gamma ray, I think this is actually an animation, uh, will travel about a meter before it runs out of steam. In xenon, it will only travel um, about 10 centimeters before it runs out of steam. So this is just kind of sets the energy scale, the properties that your detector and its surrounding shield should have. If you, if you put a meter or two of water, you can block radioactivity. If you put 10 centimeters of liquid xenon, that's enough to also block um, the radioactivity. And this just shows in a little more detail that um, these sort of multi-MeV gamma rays travel about a meter. S lower energy ones you know, run out of steam after maybe 20 centimeters. Uh, and they don't travel very far in xenon at all. The reason this is important is because uh, you can't get rid of all the radioactivity. How are you going to deal with um, the remainder? OK, so this now takes me to. Uh, the Lux detector, which is a, um, a bucket of liquid xenon about 50 centimeters on a side, instrumented in what we call a time projection chamber. Okay. So this is just a sort of artist's illustration of a wimp coming in and scattering from one of many xenon nuclei. There was a flash of light there, scintillation, which got detected mostly down here, and then an ionization signal where electrons were liberated from the xenon atoms, drifted up, in an electric field and create a second flash of light. Okay, so there's a lot of information. I'm going to try to play that. Oops. I'm going to try to play that again just to talk it through. Yeah, here we go. Okay, so again, this is a this is a bucket of liquid xenon, which is our detector medium. It's instrumented with uh, electric grids and high voltage to drift the electrons. WIMP comes in and we get a flash of light. These are detected with photomultiplier tubes. The electrons are then drifting up through the liquid and they have a pretty well-defined velocity so that by measuring the time difference between the first signal and the second signal, we can tell how deep in the detector volume uh, the events took place. We can also, because we have an array of some 60 photomultiplier tubes up here, we can tell the lateral position of where the event popped out. And we call that the, the, uh, the xy position and the depth, the z position. Okay. Now, by measuring the actual physical location of the event, we can, we can use that information in a number of ways. So remember, I, I was pointing out that, that uh, the residual radioactive background is going to sort of peter out within the first 10 centimeters. So the first thing that we can do is say, well, we're only going to accept WIMP candidate events, if they're kind of in the in in inner 100 kilograms, anything that occurs in the outer 10 centimeters, we're going to say that had too high a chance of being from radioactivity. Right? Now, if you go back to that germanium detector spectrum that I showed earlier, the only thing that was measured was the amount of energy that was deposited. There was no information as to where in the detector the event took place. So having knowledge of that, of that 3D position in space means everything because the xenon itself is very pure, but we can throw away, so, so it won't light itself up in the interior. Any background coming in from the outside, we can throw a huge fraction of it away just by saying you know, it was in the outer 10 centimeters. OK. Um, Quick question. Sure. Is that heavy water or regular water? Uh, the question was, is this heavy water or regular water? All the fluid inside the central chamber is actually liquefied xenon. So okay, sorry. yeah, and then it's going to be in a water shield, and I'll show some photos of that. Okay. Um, okay. So just some family photos of what the of what the detector looks like. 
Uh, again, it's about 50 centimeters in diameter. It's made up of copper, polyethylene, uh, and it's assembled by people in clean suits because dust is radioactive, and so we try to keep dust away from uh, the detector. And actually, humans are also radioactive. You know, the potassium in your, you know, finger oil in your fingertips is like really nasty stuff at, at the scale of a dark matter experiment. Um, the the scintillation signals are all collected with uh, photomultiplier tubes. Uh, copper turns out to be a very good material in terms of having low radioactivity. So the arrays of photomultiplier tubes are held above and below by, by these slabs of copper where it's all been carved out to, to hold the photomultiplier tubes. Um, and then the, the apparatus itself uh, is, is fully assembled and then put inside a double wall titanium vessel. Uh, we, we do that because the, the xenon itself is liquid at about 170 Kelvin. So it has to be cooled uh, and condensed into, into liquid form. So the outer, the outer jacket forms like a thermos bottle. And then that whole thing is assembled inside of a very large water tank, about uh, eight meters in diameter. And there's one of our graduate students uh, just for scale. This whole thing takes place a mile underground in, uh, in South Dakota at the Sanford Underground Research Facility. Uh, so there's a cavern here called the Davis Cavern. This is the former Homestake gold mine. Um, I don't know if any of you saw this. There was this uh, HBO series some years ago called Deadwood. This was about the, uh, the gold strike in South Dakota in 18, I think it was 1867. Uh, this is what led to not a great period in American history where you know, that land was supposed to go to Native Americans and then the Goldas and the Custer and the Black Hills. And, anyway. Um, so gold was mined there up until about 2000, and the mining company, um, you know, gold mining being a bit of a dirty business, they were done mining gold. They don't think they anticipated current gold prices, so it wasn't, you know, they had mined down to 8,000 feet. They didn't want to mine gold there anymore. They wanted to walk away and not be a super fun site, and so they, they said, well, we'll donate the facility to the federal or state government if we get to walk away. And so eventually, the state of South Dakota put together a, an authority called the South Dakota Science and Technology Authority. They took over the facility um, and started hosting science experiments, which is why, why we're there in South Dakota. Okay. Um, why are we underground? Um, at the Earth's surface, we're constantly bombarded by cosmic rays. And so these would directly light up uh, the detector and also they, they produce a particularly pesky background uh, neutron. So a cosmic ray can collide with, say, a nucleus in the wall of the cavern or in the apparatus, produce a, uh, a neutron, and that neutron being neutral, like a wimp, can sort of penetrate into the detector, scatter, and leave, and it would be difficult to tell the difference between a, a wimp and a, and a neutron. So we, we go deep underground first to cut the flux of cosmic rays, uh, so it's much less likely that, that the detector is exposed to them. Then we also put the apparatus in this water shield so that neutrons that are created in the cavern have to migrate through the water and then there's only a small chance that they'll make it. Also, as I mentioned earlier, gamma rays, so the, 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 the rock walls of the cavern are somewhat radioactive. Gamma rays that are coming out of the walls will also be stopped in the, in the water shield. So the theme here is that there's kind of a multi-layered defense, right? There's that outer layer of xenon to throw away background. There's the water shield. There's being a mile underground. You have to take all these steps kind of together to get to the point where you have a low enough background in the experiment where you can hope to see WIMPs that haven't yet been, uh, haven't yet been studied. The site itself, in terms of its physics, has, has a, a pretty glorious past. The cavern that we're working in, um, this is shown in, in, uh, in 1964, was actually hollowed out for a solar neutrino experiment done by Ray Davis. So he built a large detector based on uh, cleaning fluid um, with chlorine and looked for neutrinos from the sun. And uh, that was a very successful experiment, which led to him being awarded the Nobel Prize in or, uh, around 2002, I think. Uh, by 2009, the cavern had been enlarged to, to house our project. Uh, and uh, here's a photo of the, of the top deck of the experiment where the various umbilicals that connect to the detector. And then in the lower level, this is uh, the water tank that uh, houses that water shield. 
So, you know, we, we ride the cage down, the same cage that the miners used to use. It's about a 10 minute ride. We're uh, 4,850 feet uh, below the surface. And uh, once you're down there, um, you know, you put your lunch in the microwave, you can make a cup of espresso, you know, very, very civilized uh, conditions, right? Okay. So, um, I said uh, a few minutes ago that the xenon itself is very pure. The, the detector has to be made of low radioactivity materials. There's one hitch, though, which is that we get our xenon from the atmosphere. Xenon is about a tenth of a part per million in the atmosphere. Uh, and it also turns out that there's radioactive krypton in the atmosphere. It actually comes from, uh, it's man-made. It comes from reprocessing fuel rods. Why would you want to reprocess a fuel rod? Let's not get into that. It's a lot of plutonium, <laughs> nasty stuff. But what that does is it releases radioactive krypton-85 into, uh, into the atmosphere. So when the, when the xenon is collected from the atmosphere, you inadvertently also pick up this krypton. It's also a noble gas, so it has, you know, it doesn't. It's a. It's a noble element. It does. It's hard to. Uh, it's hard to remove chemically. It's non. It's non-reactive, right? So because this krypton would be dissolved throughout the detector volume, it's not one of those backgrounds that you could shield by throwing away the outer 10 centimeters. It could be in the center of the detector. It has a half-life of 10 years, and so since we don't want to wait 50 years to collect the xenon and do the experiment, our graduate students would have a problem with that. Um, we have to find a way to remove it. Okay. So in the xenon that we purchase, it's got about 130 parts per billion of krypton. Um, and we'd like to get it down to be less radioactive than the most radioactive component in the experiment, which are the photomultiplier tubes. So the photomultiplier tubes, this is the arrays that collect the, the scintillation light top and bottom, are equivalent to about 20 parts per trillion of, uh, of krypton. So we start with 130 parts per billion, and we want to get well below 20 parts per trillion. And so what we've developed is a, a, a system that uses charcoal to do chromatography to separate out the krypton um, and the xenon. So the idea of chromatography is that, is that you have a medium, here are filter paper, uh, with uh, different colored pigments of different size. And if you, wet, if you wet the filter paper, the capillary action causes the pigments of different sizes to spread out. And so that's why we call it chromatography. We do the same thing by dragging our xenon with its trace radioactive krypton through a charcoal column. And the idea is that the, in, in one loop, if you, if you feed in a slug of, of xenon, uh, the krypton will travel through the medium a little bit faster and you can trap it and throw it away. And then you can run a second loop to recover uh, the xenon. So um, we, you know, you you decide. Oh, I'm interested in astrophysics. I'd like to I'd like to study dark matter. So, oh, what do I have to do? I have to build a xenon detector. Now I have to do this crazy thing about becoming a chemical engineer for three years so I can get rid of the. I mean, you just you do what you have to, right? Because you can't buy a dark matter detector in a catalog. You know, if McMaster Car sold one, I would buy it instead of building uh, my own. So. Anyway, I just kind of wanted to give you a little bit of the flavor behind the scenes. You know, this, this stuff doesn't make it into the dark matter plot in the end, but boy, we sweated for two years to do, to do this thing. So I have a little bit of PTSD, so I have to, have to <laughs> kind of tell you about it. Um, so th the way that it works is that, you know, the, the, so this graph shows you the, the krypton signal as a function of time and the xenon signal after it. The krypton moves more rapidly and then the xenon comes out. So we built this, you know, basically this high purity chemical plant, you know, consisting of charcoal column and a condenser and gas handling system and all important graduate student who really sweated the details to make all this work. And, you know, I, I, I'm here because we were successful. So in a matter of months, once we built this thing, we, we managed to take this 130 parts per billion uh, and reduce it down to four parts per trillion. And we delivered the zine onto South Dakota just in time uh, to begin the experiment. So that was, that was a nice success that, uh, that, we, that we had. So, okay, now I wanna shift gears a little bit and tell you about what the signals in the experiment look like and that will kind of lead up to the uh, science result. So if you think back to that animation, there was the initial flash of light uh, when, uh, when the xenon atoms were first struck by the WIMP. Uh, and that light uh, we call S1. It's the first of two scintillation signals. And it's primarily seen 
in the bottom array of photomultiplier tubes. So now there's 120 or so PMT, 60 on the bottom, 60 on the top, and an event takes place, and we mainly see a bunch of pulses in the bottom PMTs. A little bit of the light from that first interaction reflects out and gets to the top array. So we see smaller signals in the, in the top PMTs. Then nothing happens for a couple hundred microseconds. The electrons are drifting up through the liquid. Then they pop out into the liquid, and that's the part that's got a snapshot here. And they make a second flash of light in the, in the gas phase, and then are primarily detected by the top array of PMTs. And so you see a bright, a bright set of pulses here that we call S2, the second scintillation signal. And by measuring that drift time, we get the depth of the event. Um, and we also learn, based on you know, where, where most of the light showed up in the upper array, we get to measure that lateral position. So again, that, that 3D reconstruction. In addition, there's, there's other information that we learn about the type of event by looking at the ratio of the S1 light to the S2 light. So our, our primary background, as I was saying before, comes from gamma rays, from radioactivity. And the main way that a gamma ray will interact in xenon is undergoing a Compton scatter. So you have an electron on a xenon atom sitting there. A gamma ray comes in, scatters from the electron, deposits energy to the electron. Okay. A WIMP, on the other hand, comes in, it's a neutral particle. And the main thing it interacts with is the, the xenon nucleus. Okay, so what we're trying to discriminate, once we've done everything we can to get rid of radioactivity, is can I tell the difference between an electron recoil, which would signal a gamma ray, or a nuclear recoil, which would signal a WIMP. Okay. And so conveniently, the, the S1 and S2 signals look different for electron recoils and, uh, and WIMP um, uh, uh, nuclear recoils. So I'm not really going to go through this at all in detail. There's a complicated sort of atomic physics pathway of excitations and recombination and so on that make up some number of free electrons and some number of photons from the first interaction. And the ratio of those two signals is different whether it's an electron recoil from a gamma ray or a nuclear recoil from, uh, from, from a WIMP. Okay. And just to show you that I'm not making all that up, we can mimic these interactions in the detector using uh, radioactive calibration sources. Okay. So, so now what this is is a graph, uh, it's actually two graphs, uh, of on, on the x-axis is the energy deposited in the detector, so the amount of S1 light that's produced. So again, it's just like that original germanium detector. The amount of light that you collect tells you how much energy was deposited. And on the vertical axis is the ratio of the S2 to the S1 signal, the ratio of of the charge signal to the initial light signal. And in the upper graph, we've, uh, we've, we've lighted up the detector with, with radioactive tritium, actually in the form of, of taking methane, uh, which is CH4, replacing one of the hydrogen atoms with radioactive tritium, and actually introducing that radioactivity into the xenon stream in the experiment, which is a little bit scary when you've gone to all this length to make a super pure experiment and then you have to calibrate it using something that's radioactive. And you, know, you do all these cross checks to say, yeah, it'll come back out. We'll be able to purify the xenon and get rid of the radioactivity. Um, and it worked. Um, and the challenge here is that you know, with smaller xenon detectors, you know, in the days when you were running just say a 10 kilogram detector, how did you calibrate it? Well, with, when, with a 10 centimeter detector, you could just bring up a radioactive gamma source that you could like get from a smoke detector and it would light up the whole detector. But now, if you're on the 50 centimeter scale and you really care about the detector response right in the middle, what we said, you can't get, the whole point of this big xenon detector was you can't get gamma rays to the inside. It self-shields. So how do you calibrate it? You have to light it up from the inside. How do you do that? You inject in radioactivity and, and make sure that you can remove it. So this was actually a pretty bold step. As far as we know, we're the first we call it low background experiment that deliberately introduced radioactivity into the experiment to do this, to do this calibration. Anyway, big song and dance. Uh, this to us is just like this gorgeous spectrum of simulating background events throughout the detector volume. Right? So we can have like arb you know, a million tritium induced low energy electron recoils throughout the detector volume. And so we can study the detailed response of the detector 
as a function of position, as a function of time, measure the stability, do it at the beginning of the experiment, do it at the end, really nail down the systematic response. Okay, so this one graph of the tritium shows us exactly what an electron recoil background would look like uh, in the experiment. This is like having a million background events in, in, in the detector. Okay, what about signals? So these are the background-like electron recoils to make signal-like events. Remember that I said, you know, we go deep underground to get away from cosmic rays so that we don't have any neutrons in the vicinity of the experiment because neutrons are dangerous, they're neutral, they also cause nuclear recoils just like a wimp. Um, so what we can do though is bring up artificial sources of, of neutrons um, and have those sources just for a few hours interact near the detector and that, that gives us signal-like events. Okay. Now the thing that may be a little hard to make out here is that, so we're using this graph of nuclear recoils that are induced by calibration neutrons. We, f we fit that, that band of events to this centroid, the solid red line, and you know, sort of 90% of the, of the neutron events are contained by the dashed lines. Then we take that centroid and we plot it up here, same scale, um, and we plot it here, and you can see that very few of the electron recoil events make it below the red line. Okay, so the game we play is that in the actual run of the experiment, we'll only accept WIMP candidate events that occur below the red line. We'll throw away half of our signal, the upper half, but we'll suppress 99.5% of the background. And we'll be able to do that in a very controlled way because we have these wonderful calibrations. Okay. Okay, so now what is a typical WIMP candidate event looks like, look like? Well, WIMPs don't pack very much of a punch. So unlike that calibration event I showed you earlier, uh, you know, we'll accept a WIMP candidate event with as few as two individual hits on photomultiplier tubes. This is so we push to very low energy so we can look for WIMPs that have very low mass. Then nothing happens. Now this is, this is like a macroscopic object. It's 50 centimeters across, 50 centimeters tall. And for this period of a few hundred microseconds, absolutely nothing happens. It's just dead quiet. There's no internal radioactivity. Everything's been shielded. We've gotten rid of the krypton. The tritium source has been purified away. It's just dead quiet. This is like the least radioactive place on the planet is this inner 100 kilograms of xenon. So it's really pretty cool, uh, I think. So anyway, we do a lot of you know, detailed event selection on you know, how big the S1 signal should be, how big the S2 should, signal should be, how quiet it should be in between those two periods of time, where in XY the event is, and so forth. So we did a first run of the experiment. Um, we collected 85 live days of data um, and searched inside the inner 118 kilograms. There's about 250 kilograms overall. We throw away about the outer 10 centimeters and we, and we preserve the inner 118 um, for the WIMP search. So again, calibration tells us what to expect for nuclear recoil signals, what electron recoil backgrounds will look like, and what we find from, that, for, from this run is that are, there are about 160 events in the, in the, in the run in, in this inner uh, region, 160 events, and they're, they're entirely consistent with being inside the electron recoil band. We didn't get any significant excess below the red line where WIMP candidates would, would show up. And this was the longest exposure, you know, in terms of kilograms times days of exposure with this low a background uh, that anyone has succeeded in doing yet. Okay. Now we have, you know, very, very talented postdocs that subject the data to very fancy, you know, statistical methods and they simulate what a WIMP signal would look like if it was 8 GeV and 100 GeV and everything in between um, and do all this, you know, very detailed mathematics and then they then they tell the professors what the what the result is so the uh, this first science result from Lux is captured again in this cross-section versus mass plot all the previous experiments to date are the red curve and above and then our contribution after six years of work um, is this blue curve here so all the space between this red line and this blue line we're now saying has been searched for dark matter for the first time and we didn't see anything, and that's the sense in which we're the best uh, at, at seeing nothing. 
OK. So <laughs> what are we doing now? We're continuing to run the experiment. Uh, we're trying to accumulate about 300 days worth of data. And if we don't see anything in that run, uh, then this dashed blue line will turn into a solid blue line. Uh, and then we'll, we'll keep going. Okay. So the next experiment that we're working on is called LZ. So it's the, the Lux collaboration combined with the, the Zeppelin collaboration, which is a European group that was running uh, also liquid xenon detectors. It's going to be 20 times as large as Lux. So it'll live inside the same water tank. But instead of a quarter of a ton of xenon, it'll have about seven tons in the, uh, in the, in the inner detector. Another thing that we're doing is rather than just surround it with a water shield, which is, you know, gets rid of all the gamma rays, we're, we're surrounding it with a new type of detector, uh, a scintillation detector uh, that's doped with gadolinium. What will that do for us? Well, one of the things, if we, if we did see some events below that red line that suggested that they were WIMP candidates, you would say to me, rightly so, Dan, how can you be so sure those are WIMPs and not some residual radioactivity? So by surrounding the new apparatus with another detector, one that's very good at seeing gamma rays, one that's very good at seeing neutrons, we'll be able to continuously monitor the residual background of the experiment. Right? So we have some radioactivity inside that we haven't fully characterized in building the experiment. Not only will it interact in the xenon, but it'll, it, it will interact in the outer detector. So we have like a continuous monitor of background. So now you really have to bend over backwards to say, you know, you saw an event below the red line, and you didn't see anything in your nice souped up gadolinium scintillator detector. You know, now, now we should really be able to convince ourselves that if we see something, it's real. So really, um, in the jargon of our field, we're calling this, a, this is a discovery instrument. Well, of course, Lux was a discovery instrument, but this is even, this is even better. OK. So we're doing a lot of this work at Slack. We're in the process of building uh, a liquid noble test platform. So these are sketches that were completed some months ago, and it takes forever to do lab renovations. And just in the last month, uh, we're finally starting to um, you know, install some of our equipment. So we're going to use this to, to you know, try to master a number of the, of the technical challenges that are involved in, in making these larger detectors. Um, the lab was interested in, in uh, having us do this because there are other applications of liquid noble detectors uh, using argon or xenon for other applications. So there's already been interest at the lab uh, you know, from other groups that are, that are interested in working with us. Um, we got to do the whole krypton removal thing all over again, a factor of 100 better. So we're going to build um, you know, another uh, chemical plant um, to do this at you know, better, faster, not cheaper. Thick two, usually, they say, or one. Uh, the, the site that we've been given to work in is, uh, I don't know if people are familiar with the Babar experiment. This was the B meson experiment, the last particle physics experiment that was done at SLAC using, um, using the accelerator there. So that was, that was dismantled, and the interaction hall, IR2 was the, the interaction hall where that experiment was housed, uh, was cleared out, and uh, we were given space um, you know, in this structure and along the side uh, to build our test platform. Uh, and then the main footprint in the building is a, is a brand new clean room that's being built for the LSST experiment, uh, which is a, to do a dark energy survey. They're going to be building the world's biggest camera uh, right next door to us. Now, you know, it's funny working at, at, at the lab. They, they did um, sort of a little PR write-up for I think if you go to the Slack homepage, it's one of the, one of the little stories that pops up. Um, about dark matter, and we wanted to talk up all this cool stuff we're doing with krypton removal and all that. And they're like, well, you know, we don't want to say that you're removing radioactivity from the xenon because that will kind of, you know, make our neighbors nervous. They'll think, well, well how are they going to dispose of this radioactivity? So I was really trying to say, you know, we should use this as a teaching moment because then I went and calculated the total amount of radioactivity in the 20 tons of xenon or 10 tons of xenon that we're going to process at Slack. Is, is equivalent to about 20 bananas. Yeah, OK. So getting rid of the, that residual radioactivity, it just kind of underscores how clean the environment is that we have to make um, for a dark matter experiment. Um, so I probably should, I should probably wrap up and just put up this last plot, which shows, um, just to put LZ in context. So this is the result we have so far from Lux. 
this is, uh, in the absence of a detection, the result that we'll have from the longer run of LUX. And then this is the, the increment in sensitivity uh, that we should see from a three-year run of LZ. Eventually, we start to hit irreducible backgrounds from neutrinos, which if we don't see WIMPs uh, by the end of LZ or maybe an upgrade, then it might be game over at that point. But I have job security at least until retirement, so <laughs> that's good. Um, put it in the context of the field, um, a study was done uh, a couple of years ago to, to kind of put on one graph all of the dark matter experiments that have run solid lines and have been proposed, uh, and then you know where where the neutrino floor will kind of fully start to kick in. And um, LZ is kind of the boldest uh, of these, promising that you know we can get almost to that neutrino floor uh, with this um, ten ton experiment. So. I hope I've convinced you that dark matter is an exciting topic with an exciting future, that liquid xenon time projection chambers are playing you know, a role being at, at, the, you know, at the frontier. Um, stay tuned for a more results from Lux over the next couple of years. Uh, and then on a sort of 10 year time scale, we'll see if we hit that neutrino floor. Thank you very much. I'm going to use my privilege to ask the first question. So when you say hitting the neutrino floor, mm -hmm. um, and beyond that, you would have to design a different kind of uh, experiment. Or you would show that there is no WIMP. There are no WIMPs. Yeah, so, so really what would happen is, so we would basically encounter a background that A, we couldn't shield, because we don't have light years of lead. And B, we could no longer distinguish from a WIMP. And so by the neutrino floor, I mean at that point, there are astrophysical neutrinos produced in the atmosphere, produced by the sun, et cetera, that will just create background in the detector that we can't do anything about. But WIMPs as a dark matter are still in the play. It's, it's just... We wouldn't be able to search for them using any known means. Okay. So, ah, so the other thing is that, um, you know, a according to the theorists, if you look at this graph, there, there are dark matter candidates that, you know, or, or further down the graph. We, so WIMPs might exist in nature, yeah. but no one's thought of a way to try to detect them once you start to encounter these neutrino backgrounds. So game over in the sense of, you know, we, it may just simply be beyond our reach. Yeah. 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 Uh, yes, very good talk. I, I wonder, uh, is there any way to connect what you've learned, the, the, the final graph LZ sensitivity with one of those first curves you showed supporting the existence of WIMPs, that what that radial flat curve, and somehow what you've discovered in your experiments so far at sensitivity, is there any way to infer what the WIMP distribution might be around, like let's say the Milky Way, mm. so to give the, the right, these rotational right. velocity measurements? Yeah, I mean, un until we until we discover WIMPs. We can't really say much at all about the astrophysics, about the rotation curve, and so forth. Um, if we were to discover WIMPs at the current scale of experiment, there's a, there's a follow-up technology um, called a, it's a low, low pressure, actually it's similar to time projection chamber, but it's a gas that's run at very low pressure. The idea is if you, instead of having a condensed, so a condensed medium like xenon is nice because it, allows you to pack a lot of detector mass in a small volume. If we were to discover WIMPs, um, then what we, would, that what we would do as a field uh, is, to, is to employ a gaseous detector, and actually you'd have to make it well below atmospheric pressure, maybe about a tenth or twentieth of an atmosphere. And now those nuclear recoils would actually travel a, a, a macroscopic distance in the detector, and you'd be able to image those tracks. And because of the kinematics, you know, the solar system is orbiting the galactic center, there's kind of a preferred direction. We like to say we're headed into a wimp wind. So if we could measure the, the direction of those recoil tracks in a low pressure TPC, then we would begin to learn something about the, the kinematics and, and, and know for sure that, you know, we were, um, we were sort of headed into this rotation curve. But just measuring energy, de energy depositions and knowing something about the cross-section, that would give us kind of a first clue that we're kind of in the right kinematic regime. Um, but to really tie the whole thing together, um, you'd, you'd, you'd like to 
go into the area of we call WIMP astronomy. Right now, we're just kind of a discovery experiment. Is there anything there at all? And then what, what follow-ups might be technologically possible? Um, that was almost exactly my question. Would it be possible to distinguish between your trigger event and your signal event to get some directionality of the recoil yeah, back? But and that's, sounds that's like you really, answered it. Yeah, and there, you know, there was a time when you know people were building these low pressure TPCs at the comparable mass scale to the condensed uh, detectors, like the germanium detectors and the xenon detectors. But so much easier and cost effective to scale up these technologies that, unfortunately, now. The, the, the low pressure TPCs are, are kind of being kept alive as, you know, a follow-up technology. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Dan, a buddy of mine in Holland is working on non-Newtonian gravity. Yes. And I, I suppose he's, exp he's hoping that you'll just continue to fail. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm just sort of wondering, what about the AMX, you know, the alpha magnetic spectrometer on the yes. International Space Station, this yeah. guy Tang, whatever his name is. Right. Yeah, is, is he wasting Tang. his time because it sounds like you've got, no, got him beat no. in terms of sensitivity? Well, you know, the, the, there, are, you know there are regions where, where WIMP, you know, this, we call this direct detection, you know, setting an atomic nucleus in the path of a WIMP and seeing, seeing the interaction. Um, the, the class of experiments that you're, that you're mentioning, we, we call indirect detection, where we're looking for um, you know, if WIMPs are present in the galaxy um, or, you know, collecting in the center of the sun or what have you, then, then they should eventually reach sufficient concentrations where they annihilate. Um, and then we could look for, you know, that back reaction. They would turn back into protons and antiprotons or positrons and electrons. We might be able to see them as, a, as an indirect detection astrophysical signal. Um, and then, then there's also making dark matter in the laboratory. And we go back to that original, that so-called Feynman diagram. We had you know quark and anti-quark turning into WIMP. If you if you if you turn that on its side, that's the kind of experiment we're doing. We're trying to see a WIMP and a quark collide. If you turn it backwards, then you're doing indirect detection. You're trying to see a WIMP and an anti-WIMP turn back into standard model particles. Uh, and then if you run it in the forward direction, like they're doing at the LHC, you're trying to make dark matter in the laboratory. All of those are completely legitimate enterprises, and for any of them to produce a convincing result would be wonderful for the other two things. Because there's, there's places where we overlap in sensitivity, and then there's regions of parameter space where you know, we have access to high mass WIMPs, but the LHC runs out of energy. So, you know, and, and likewise with indirect detection. So uh, you really want to look for it all different ways, and then to really say you've solved you know, the dark matter riddle, you know, you want information from all those different areas converging because they all contribute, you know, different information about, uh, you know, about the parameter space. Yeah, so. Uh, a couple of months ago at Stanford, there was a talk about another kind of dark matter thing, and it was the attempt to detect axions yes. Yes. up at the University of Washington, yes. I think. Yeah. Uh, yeah. He re yeah. did not refer to those as WIMPs, and in fact, are That's they right. Much yeah, so lighter? yeah, axions are extremely light particles, and they're detected in a in a completely different way. Uh, so I refer to WIMPs as one of the leading candidates, uh, axions being the other. So again, it's a particle that was predicted by a riddle in particle physics. Um, if I could use just you know baldly use jargon for a moment, in the strong interaction, we expect there to be CP violation. A uh, hypothesis was put forward for a new symmetry in nature that suppresses CP. Uh, in fact, Helen Quinn, a theorist at Slack, was one of the co-proposers of that model. Uh, and so people have been looking for the axion in the laboratory uh, and as a dark matter candidate um, you know, to, to, to try to see. Uh, so again, it's an interesting place where you have suggestions from particle physics about particles that might exist in nature that have nothing on the face of it to do with cosmology, but have just the right properties to be, uh, to be the dark matter. Yeah. So. So axion's very, very legit, yeah. So are you at all close to proving that WIMPs cannot uh, explain the dark matter issue, or what would it take to prove that there are not enough WIMPs to account for the dark matter? Yeah, see, yeah. So, you know, there, the Einstein said, uh, subtle is the Lord, and the rest of that quote is, but malicious he is not. I'm not so sure. Um, 
because it could be, you know, could be down here, and we could never rule it out. You know, I mean, you can make, you know, with the with the kind of collisions that if you if you arrange the particle physics just wrong, you can make lots of dark matter in the early universe by arranging the annihilation physics in just the right way that you freeze out at the relic density that we're looking for, but arrange it such that the, po the probability of a scattering event as opposed to annihilation event is, is just in essentially invisible to you. And so we'll never be able to prove that WIMPs don't exist. But my, our argument is that we, we should at least look in this very reasonable region of parameter space and hope that nature cooperates. Nature gets a vote. Uh, I'd, li I'd like to say, say that um, what some of the great triumphs in physics over many, many years have been null experiments which are really well done. Right. And you're in that game. I mean, you're, you're doing a very right. good job Thank of uh, establishing what might turn out to be a m right. null experiment. Right. The importance of that, I think, would be it would be a revolutionary influence on cosmology. And, and, and um, I want to call to your attention, if you're not already aware of it, there have been developments in theory in the last, in the last few years which are beginning to indicate in a very in, internally coherent way uh, and consistent way that dark matter is not needed to account for the excessive rotation of the outer, in the outer reaches of galaxy, mm -hmm. it is mm -hmm. not needed to account for acceleration of Hubble expansion, mm -hmm. and it is not needed to account for what is known about galactic halos. Mm -hmm. I have a paper here published a couple of months ago, okay. of which I'll give you a copy, which okay. makes that point. Okay. And so that's also quite possible. And, and this Absolutely. theory produces yeah. numbers, yeah. and yeah. the numbers are consistent for these right. three phenomena. Right, okay. thank you. Yeah. Um, how deep uh, could we go to be able to get a better, you know, uh, opportunity to be able to detect? Mean deep, 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 yeah, deep, yeah, deep, deep underground. Are there are there right, deeper right. mines that you are looking at, or there, there are? Australia turns out, or yeah, tur turns out this is this is kind of deep enough. Oh. In other words, given even a ten ton or even a fifty ton yeah. scale experiment. It's deep enough. Um, it's an interesting question, though. The, so working deeper and deeper be starts to become more and more inconvenient because you start to have geothermal heating. And so it's just a diff more difficult environment, more air handling, energy that you know needs to be expended to keep but physicists. Yeah. That's what they have been right. Saying. right. And, but then eventually, um, because neutrinos, astrophysical neutrinos, are also coming up through the Earth, when you get to about, I think it's about 11,000 feet, so about twice as deep, then you, then you start to reach diminishing returns because the neutrinos are interacting in the Earth, producing muons, and they're just going to come from, from above. So. Yeah. The uh, hypothetical limbs have a habit of annihilating each other, uh, so they would uh, dissipate over time. Do you, does that create a constraint on how dense they can be? To, so, to be so still be around? I'm not sure. I, I, I just say the question again. The, the they dissipate over time with a uh, rapidity of proportional to the square of their density. Ah, right, right. So, so, so you're talking like in the, in the context of this so indirect in, in detection? Given that we're doing this experiment 14.7 billion ah. years after the Big Bang, does that constrain yes. the... Uh, no, so the whole, for, for the experiments that we're doing, the, the whole idea of that freeze-out argument is that you know, w once the WIMPs have frozen out, they're now sufficiently far apart that on their cosmological density, um, they, they will not find each other to, to interact with. Okay, so they won't, the, the cosmological density of WIMPs, you know, is unchanged from what was imprinted, you know, back in the early universe. Um, so they, the, the, the only one, one concern you might have is, are the WIMP, particles themselves stable, or do they undergo some decay process? Um, and so one of the requirements for WIMP candidates, of course, is that they're, they're stable you know, on, on the time scale of the age of the universe. So. so the stroke is places where they concentrate just as the core of the star would not have annihilated significant numbers of Yeah, so there we're, you know, we're trying to get to the, trying to get to as if we have some control over the knobs, uh, but trying to get to the point where 
they're sufficiently collected um, that they'll annihilate away at a detectable rate. But they're still so weakly interacting that those interactions are so rare that the densities won't appreciably change as, as, as far as I understand it. OK, let's thank our speaker again. <laughs> so Dan, every speaker gets this <laughs> special SETI mug Great. with alien robots talking to each other. And if you have further questions, uh, please come up here. Thank you.